sing another note. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Executive Vice President of Public Affairs and Chief of Staff at Nickelodeon Group, Executive Vice President of Global Inclusion Strategy at Viacom Networks, and one of this year's gala co-chairs, Ms. Marva Smalls. Good evening, and um, please join me in giving Vi Higginson's Gospel for Teens Choir another round of applause. Thank you, young men and women. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Election Network's third Triumph Awards. Tonight, we are especially delighted that all of you are here to help us honor three distinguished individuals. Sean Diddy Combs. Yes. Ingrid Saunders Jones. And George Lucas. Each of our honorees in their own unique way understands the call to help those in need and are unselfish in their work in this area, truly epitomizing the work of the National Action Network. And I would also tonight like to thank my co-chair, Tanya Lewis Lee, who unexpected travel um, has dictated that she not be with us this evening. And we would like to thank Viacom and BET Networks for being an underwriter this evening, and our gold sponsors, the Coca-Cola Company, Comcast, Forest City Ratner, General Electric, Global Hue, Lucasfilms, and Walmart. And there are too many others to acknowledge from the stage, but you can find their names in this evening's journal. And I also want to thank you for your indulgence and your flexibility as we have had to adjust the program for this evening. The presidential debate presented a challenge for us, and one especially for our fearless leader, Reverend Sharpton, as he juggles his on-air responsibilities. And for those of you who are just getting to know a little bit about all of the great work of the National Action Network, I hope tonight will shed even more light on their importance to New York and this country. Founded by Reverend Sharpton to follow the civil rights and leadership teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., the National Action Network has been a beacon of hope to many that simply look for equality of opportunity and justice. The National Action Network has worked with Presidents Clinton, Bush, Obama, with governors such as Governor Patterson, Spitzer, and Bush, mayors such as D Dinkins, Bloomberg, Booker, and national leaders on both sides of our political aisles. It is truly one of the great preeminent organizations in the nation that fights for justice and fairness. So for over 20 years of passionate activism, for the inspirational leadership of Reverend Al Sharpton, for your dedication and to justice and decency and equal opportunity, and for your outstanding work in criminal justice, nonviolence, education, voter protection, and so many other critical areas. Thank you, National Action Network. Thank you, your staff, your volunteers, your board, and again, Reverend Sharpton. And I think, I believe, that it is incumbent on all of us here no matter our expertise, no matter what field we work in, no matter where we are or what we're doing, to find our own ways to support the values and the goals of the National Action Network, be it financial, be it volunteer, be it through your expertise, 
we need to do whatever we can to advance the causes of equal opportunity, civil and human rights, and for a more equal and just society. So again, thank you for joining us tonight, and I hope you will enjoy this evening. Now it gives me extreme great pleasure to welcome my friend and our mistress of ceremonies, actor, producer, and director, Tamara Tooney. Thank you. Thank you, Marva. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to be here with you for the third annual National Action Network's Triumph Awards. Tonight, I'm honored to be here with you to salute tonight's honorees, Mr. Sean Diddy Combs, Ms. Ingrid so Saunders-Jones, and Mr. George Lucas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite to the stage uh, Ms. Tamika Mallory. Hello, good evening, and thank you all for being here this evening. And I want to join Marva Smalls, our co-chair for this evening, in thanking all of you for adjusting your schedules to be with us. We understand that it truly is a hardship when people uh, invite you at one time and then all of a sudden tell you you've got to come two hours early. Uh, but we want to thank all of you for being with us. And we certainly uh, know that this, this presidential debate, what is happening this evening, is very important. This organization is very politically engaged. Um, and we understand the importance of having uh, you know, everyone be able to go and participate and see the debate. I'm not 100% sure what happened with the program, but Reverend Sharpton's video is actually supposed to be happening at this moment, and he is going to be coming up. So I will come back and bring my remarks, um, but if we can have Reverend Sharpton's video to play at this time, let's please watch a few words about our president and founder. He was honored um, by BET himself this year, and I want you to hear a little bit about why we need Reverend Sharpton. He is our leader, he is my leader, and the work that he's doing with the National Action Network is something that we hope all of you will continue to support because he truly is the hardest working man that I know. So please watch the screen and next voice that you will hear will be the president and founder of the National Action Network. Born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I preached my first sermon when I was four. I had to stand on a box because I was too little for them to see me over the phone. By the time I was seven, I had become known as the Wonder Boy Preacher. And the Wonder Boy Preacher would go from the pulpit to the front lines, using his voice to become one of the most important civil rights leaders of our time. It was uh, in the 60s, uh, very uh, polarized time. The civil rights movement was going in the South. I started studying Dr. King, Reverend Jackson, and others, and said, my calling is to fight injustices. He knew that every struggle carried with it the weight of our past and the hopes of a more righteous future. The most rewarding thing is to give a sense of hope and a sense of support to people that feel they would have been ignored. That fulfills me. You got a bunch of folk that can be well known. Celebrity, go to the White House, have a show. You don't have a lot of people that can go to kids that were abused and stand up with their mothers, mothers like my mother, who was ignored and marginalized, and say, no, you don't respect them. I've never fought any of these cases that people didn't call me. You know, people always say, oh, they like ambulance chases. They go shopping, something happens. Well, I'm not an ambulance chaser, I'm more like the ambulance. People call me and I'll come. People call others and they won't come. I've stood in the mall maybe 20 times in my life and watched mothers have to identify their kids that was killed wrong. I've seen people call me the N-word, throw water numbers at me, sing it out in the neighborhood. I've seen knives in my chest. I've seen the burglar sound. 
But I also watched Barack Obama put his hand on the Bible and become 44, 39, 6. I've seen enough happen to believe no matter how bad it is, we can break from the win. So every day that I face something, I know in my heart we can win because I've seen too many victories to believe the defeats going to happen last year. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and founder of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you. Well, thank you, and we certainly want to thank all of you that at the last moment adjusted your schedules to come early. Uh, because this being debate night, we wanted to not only uh, make sure that everyone could enjoy uh, this annual event, but also see the debate. And if you watch it on the right channel, you'll see me before and after the debate tell you what happened at the debate. <coughs> not that I'm advertising a certain channel. To all of our elected officials and to our board members, well, all of the board members of Nash Action Network that are present stand, our chairman and our board members. <clears throat> Let me say that when we give awards, being that we are on the front line, we are very sensitive about those that we honor because we do not feel that success is defined just by someone reaching a certain title or a certain material possession, but that they have had a meaning to those that we serve every day. In my life, I've seen a lot of issues and a lot of people that have been victimized by the issues. I do not choose to be identified with people that I don't think identifies with the very character that this country ought to be projecting. So it is very clear to us, every day of our lives and activities, that it is important that we raise those models that we feel represent something that represents depth. It's one thing for people in ivory towers to decide to cast some platitudes down on others. It's different for those of us that are in the trenches that are doing the fighting every day to say these people deserve to be honored, these are the people that are respected, and these are the people that mean something. The three that we honor tonight exemplify and personify that. Ingrid Saunders Jones has been a legendary corporate executive. She's been one that no matter how high she went in the corporate world, she never lost her grounding in her community and in her love for people in everyday life. I do not know anyone in the corporate world that has shown more sensitivity, consistency, and sacrifice than her, and she would be honored tonight. There are those that will write the history of cinema, the history of movie making. In any book written, on the history of Hollywood, it would not be complete without a chapter on George Lucas. People reach the pinnacle of success and begin to isolate themselves and spend most of their time trying to enjoy whatever life they have. To turn around when you've reached that pinnacle and decide to put your own reputation and resources in telling stories of people who were marginalized and silenced is something that has not been exhibited any uh, time that I can think of in Hollywood and certainly not often in our lifetime. When George Lucas went with his reputation, with his high respectable standing and couldn't get a movie studio to put out the story of the Tuskegee Airmen and had the rugged determination to force that story into the theaters only because of his determination, only because of his sacrifice. He gained not only the respect 
of African Americans, but gained the respect of all people around the world. It touched me personally. I went one day to meet Melody Hobson, a longtime supporter of this organization who is here tonight and will be introduced. And to my surprise, she introduced me to George Lucas, who immediately went into an unscheduled sermon to me. <laughs> and he held me in rapt attention. His pulpit was the St. Regis Hotel restaurant about the racism in Hollywood and how this story needs to be told. And I was convinced I was ready to sell tickets on the corner of Times Square. I took it personally. I preached Percy Sutton's funeral, who was a Tuskegee Airman. I knew the days that Tuskegee Airmen talked about, how they had served the country and nobody cared about them. Nobody ignored, nobody would, would stop the ignoring of them. I remember Percy Sutton and Roscoe Brown and others speaking about the life they lived that no one seemed to care. George Lucas made the world care. And he did it not as a documentary, he did it as an action movie. That people that don't normally care about history went to see the movie. And people that don't normally care about action movies learned a lot of history. And for that and his tremendous achievement, one of the great actors of all time, the highest selling uh, movie actor of all time, Samuel Jackson, who himself, who we've honored in himself, who has meant so many and who has who meant so much to so many and has stood as a symbol himself, he will present the award tonight. And uh, if he uses other language, George, he's speaking in unknown tongues. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I'm to present tonight the, the award that I personally have watched this young man grow. You know him as a celebrity. I know him as someone cere cerebral. I was able in my life to meet great people. I was raised by James Brown. James Brown adopted me as a son he didn't have when I was 16. I remember James Brown told me one day that there are those that make hits and then there are those that set a tone for the hits. I said to him in his later life, I said, Mr. Brown, do you miss not being on the top 10 records? He said, no. I developed the one, two, three beat. I developed the one, three, the half beat. And if you look at the top 10, five of the records are built on my beat. When you change the paradigm, you don't need a hit because whoever hits is using your stuff. This young man, way a long time ago, grew beyond needing just hits. He developed and set the trend and brought rap into hip hop and changed the cultural paradigm of American culture. So whoever is successful in hip hop is doing puffy. Whoever walks down Broadway with a strut is doing puffy. Whoever can go in a boardroom and use the streets to outmaneuver and outsmart the sweets is doing puffy. He has not made hits, he is the hit. And all of those that have innovated in this era has used the paradigm that he has changed. We are going to give the first award to him. He not only has made us all dapper, including me who he calls Pop, I want you to know he designs my stuff, but he has changed the entrepreneurial business mind of the hip hop community. Puffy Cone now is a mogul with a television network, a record company, a clothing line. Who would have thought a young man coming from Mount Vernon, raising a single parent home, would sit up as a co-equal with those that run their own television station, their own record companies, but never lose his authenticity. People can look to him and see what American success looks like in black. Why was it so important to me to come and present this award? Is because there are kids that can look to Puffy, like I look to James Brown. You see, those that went to the Ivy League schools and those that had the pedigree and come out of stable homes, 
they were expected to be something. Those of us that didn't have the advantages, we need a Puffy to tell us, you know something, I can do it too. And every time he produces a hit, every time he signs a new deal, every time he breaks down a new barrier, he scored a point for kids that people felt they could never achieve, can achieve, because he beats those that had the advantages, he beats those that were expected to be something, and he makes the unexpected know that we can win and beat you at your own game. Watch the video, the story of Sean Puffy Cole. Music, theater, film. I need some brilliant ideas right now. Ross, who wants to do a rap album? Shut TV, fashion, fragrance, luxury brands. Let's see my son who say it. Whatever he targets, he conquers. Ambition for success isn't limited to his individual accomplishments, but extends into the world of philanthropy. You start to realize that you know you weren't put here to to just be um, just to make money, just to be successful. Like some of the things that you thought you were put here for, you start to realize you know, I know it's bigger than that. For him, it's very much like if I'm going to be involved in education, I'm going to put my sneakers on and I'm going to run the marathon myself. Two million dollars raised in 26.2 grueling miles for New York City's public schools and for children with HIV and AIDS. He, uh, for over 10 years, has had a foundation in Daddy's House social programs, which essentially is an educational program targeted to underserved communities. And every child that participated in that program uh, improved their grades. Marshalling his and other celebrity firepower, he created citizen change to spur voter registration. Just watch Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11. And it just came to the office and he's just like, you know, this voting in this election is so important. And he's like, literally, if you don't vote, you can die. Man of perpetual motion. A man who inspires and leads by example. He has a famous quote which says, dream at night when you wake up, go get it done. We'll continue to see Pop do wonderful things for the next 10, 20, 30 years. They touch a lot of lives and we'll all learn from them. He didn't want to become a guy. But he broke some rules in the business style. He's one of the first to break it the way he broke it. He's licensed it, he swapped it, he wrapped it, he produced it, he record copied it. He took it to higher levels than we had ever seen. Hello. For his activism and altruism, National Action Network is pleased to present the 2012 Triumph Award to Sean D. Combs. I've seen him in Harlem playing with youngsters. I've seen him at Daddy's house giving love. I've seen him go to Broadway and hold people spellbound as he did a raisin in the sun that no one thought he could do. I've seen him do reality show where he get gangster. He is the most multi-talented person that has been on the scene. He's created trends. But under all of that, he's the same brother he was in Mount Vernon. I remember calling him earlier this year and we were talking about voting. Why did I call him, if truth be told, it was vote or die that he started in 2004 that registered a whole generation of young people that grew up in 2008 and helped elect Barack Obama. Diddy never got credit for that. He planted the seed that became a flower. Why did I call him? Because I knew he would understand. And I told him what they were doing with the voter ID laws and the voter suppression laws. He said, Pops, what do y'all need to get started? I said, well, we got to raise a lot of money. We need at least 50 grand. He said, Pops, don't ever ask me about 50 grand. Start at 100. I'm going to send you some money, get started, and call me back. Three weeks later, he said, Pops, you didn't call me back. You got to learn how to beg, Pops. That's the kind of person he is. That's the kind of humanitarian he is. But he's a multi-talented person that has changed culture in America. It is with great pride 
I present the Triumph Award to our friend, our brother, the only one that I let call me Pops because I try to stay young, Sean Diddy Cole. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. God is truly the greatest. Um, and I say that it's from the bottom of my heart as I, as I look out the window. It's, it's surreal for me growing up in Harlem, New York, um, a couple of blocks away from here, um, and, and to be here right now. When you get a chance to get honored with a, an award, especially an award of this magnitude, it truly makes you reflect. Um, number one, you ask yourself the question, especially if it's not an award that you were going after, like I always wanted a Grammy, you know what I'm saying? So I was going after that. So then, you know, when you get an award of this magnitude um, by such a prestigious organization, you ask yourself, are you truly worthy of this award? And for me, I had to be honest with myself. Um, I had to honestly look at those that have come before me and the responsibility that they, they've taken on, that they took on, and, and honestly spoiling me and also a, a generation um, of young people like me to just feel like the things that we were able to do, we were able to do it just through the, the um, hip hop spirit and the, and the hip hop culture, which the truth is our culture of having a sense of entitlement that we deserve to be treated fairly and we deserve to have swag and be leaders actually came from those before us, like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Quincy Jones, Clarence Avant, um, and Reverend Al Sharpton who I think deserves a special round of applause. Hold on a second, hold, hold on one, one second. A special round of applause, not only for what he's done in the community, but for the way he's wearing that suit tonight. Because <laughs> some of us, when we get um, our chance to get on TV, we just be wearing the one wrong suit and the fit be all the way wrong. And um, he's found himself a mean Italian tailor. I don't know who his tailor is, but I will find out tomorrow. Give it up for Al Sharpton in that suit, boy. Um, I'm gonna get back in a second to just how I feel about getting this award, but I really wanna acknowledge George Lucas um, for, for, for what you did to my brain um, as a kid and watching Star Wars. Um, it just the ability to dream and, you know. And then when you put Samuel Jackson in there, to see, you don't even understand, to see a black man in Star Wars, um, it just lets you know it can be done. And also I want to acknowledge Samuel L. Jackson, what you do and what you continue to do We'll go into time and go into history, and we, any of us can only bless in the world of entertainment to follow in your footsteps. Thank you for all the obstacles that you had to overcome to even get into Star Wars, which I know is crazy. <laughs> Give a round of applause <laughs> to Samuel Jackson for believing in almost the impossible, and you did, brother. And Ingrid Saunders Jones, thank you for all that you do every day and um, all that you continue to do. 
and also must acknowledge because we are nothing without our teams. Marva Smalls, right. Tonya Lewis Lee, and Tamika Mallory. Thank you very much. So um, when I was reflecting about this award, I was, I honestly, it, 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 it was, oh, I've had some wake up calls this year, and this was like the third, like in the last two years, this is the third wake up call. The first wake up call was, um, I have three girls, um, one six and two twins that are tw five years old, and they and they have six kids total, three boys and three girls, and um, something just changed in me when my girls started talking and asking me questions. Um, it was different than the boys because you know you can have the boys go out and play, okay, y'all can bump your head. You know, I'll, I'll get to y'all and, you know, come on tour with me. We'll have a good time. We'll play video games. But the question is that young girls, young little future women ask you, it, it, it wakes you up and it, it kind of helps your evolution. And I needed some help in my evolution because um, I was in the world of entertainment and I was blessed with a lot early. And so I was kind of behind on my personal evolution. And that was one thing that had, you know, really woke me up. And um, I also just through, I would say, like the last year, just I got a chance to um, go to L.A. And I was like, I'm, that's going to be my next thing. I'm going to conquer Hollywood. And um, I was woken up real quick. And I just started having all these flashbacks of the civil rights movement. <laughs> and I realized that I wasn't the regular shade of black, that I was extra like bluish black. <laughs> and um, I started to appreciate things a lot more, you know, just being able to live the way I lived and do the things I do and, and, and you know, just this year, just things, I, I call him Pops because um, he, he's like that, 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 that father that, you know, my father was killed when I was three, that father that we all um, kind of, is there for us as a father, and he fills that void for us because he's actually the one we call when we're in trouble. That's really the only number that really picks up. <laughs> 911 is a joke. They don't really pick up, but Al Sharpton, he'll always pick up. And so I got tired of calling him for being in trouble and uh, started calling him for some personal advice. Like, you know, what do I need to do next? You know, um, I needed to go beyond people thinking about the money in the Forbes list or the fur or the white party or what the celebrity of it all is. Like, like what, what do I need to do? I need some help in growing, you know, as a man. And um, went to his office, and he would sit down, and he would talk to me, and he would also listen. That's why his suit looks so nice right now. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I was, you know, flying from L.A. to get this award, I was honestly like, this is something that I want to keep by my nightstand, because I want to know, I want it to remind me that I still have growing up to do, and I have a lot of catching up to do, and I have a lot of work to do. Um, to whom much is given, much is expected, and I take on that challenge. And um, I, I appreciate what everybody in here has done, you know, more than ever. And, um, you know, I may, I may have woken up or grew up uh, just, you know, a couple of years too late, but better late than never. And um, I plan on making y'all proud, and I plan on making this man proud. And I thank God for Reverend Al Sharpton, and I thank God for all of us in here and the opportunities that we have. And I, pray, and I spread that amongst our generation, but I can show you better than I can tell you. Thank you for this award.
As we continue tonight's awards presentations, let's take a moment to learn more about the National Action Network and its very noble, modern civil rights agenda, which em emphasizes a standard of decency for all people, regardless of race or sexual preference, social justice for all communities, and improvements in race relations. Please watch the video. And let the church say amen. It's a lot of amazing work there. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, this organization truly is a beacon for social equality. To give us further insight 
on the National Action Network's mission, let's welcome to the stage the National Executive Director of the National Action Network, Ms. Tamika Mallory. Let's welcome her back. Thank you so much, Tamar. I'm back. So as just witnessed, National Action Network is a very, very busy organization. And all of you who are here this evening are in some way a part of the work that we are doing um, within the organization. Uh, we, in, in addition to all of the things that you've seen, we've opened offices in Los Angeles, Miami, Detroit, and Ohio over the last year so that our organization is present in all of the places where our work is needed the most. Uh, President Obama said that the National Action Network is not the National Satisfaction Network. It is the National Action Network. And that is, in fact, a very true point because the National Action Network is all about action. We are busy and engaged with local communities everywhere across this nation. One of the things that we appreciate about our president is that no matter where he is or what he's doing or how many awards he may receive or the fact that he's on television every evening at 6 p.m. on MSNBC, make sure that you're watching, um, he still ensures that our staff is able to do work on the ground, that we are engaged with local communities and making sure that that our chapters are working with those people who are voiceless and giving them a voice. And so all of the work that we do is sustained by those of you who are members, supporters, friends, um, our corporate sponsors, people who give to National Action Network, volunteer with the organization, despite all of the, what the naysayers may tell you, that you shouldn't work with the organization for this reason or that reason. But you, brothers and sisters, know that in any moment it could be you that faces an injustice. And as uh, Mr. Combs said, and I was really excited to hear him say that, this organization answers the phones. But we need you all to help us keep the phones on. So we need you to work with us and continue to support the work that we're doing. Uh, you saw a lot in the video about the Occupy the Corners movement. Gun violence has been on the rise in this nation. I know that many of you know the story of the four-year-old young boy. Uh, his name was Lloyd Morgan Jr. He was shot in a crossfire this year in the summer while his mom had him outside at a park. Uh, National Action Network got involved and we not only worked with the family and provided resources so that the mother could lay her child to rest, and we wanted to make sure, I particularly wanted to make sure, that he didn't just have any old funeral, that he had a funeral fit for a young king. And we did that. Um, we pulled the resources of our board members and our friends together, and we really did give young Lloyd Morgan a very wonderful service. But once the service was over, we had to do some real work. We've been working with a lot of the organizations that do street work, that work with young people who are vulnerable and angry for many reasons. And a lot of us turn off the TV, lock our doors, and ignore what is happening with our young people on the streets. But these organizations are there, and many times they are the only thing between the trigger and the finger. And we wanted to get these organizations together show them support and bring National Action Network's national recognition to these organizations um, and, and pull them together, but also bring out elected officials and others who will work with folks that they would not generally work with or support. We were able to do that, and for four weeks during this summer, we occupied corners in Brooklyn, in Queens, in Manhattan, in the Bronx, we, were, we had people out on the corners from 11 p.m. until 1 a.m. every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, and Reverend Sharpton was out on those corners with us. And I am here to tell you that not one gun was fired on the corners that we occupied during the time that we were out on those corners. And we didn't go to the safe places because it's easy to go to places where there is no violence already and say that. We went to some of the hardest, most dangerous neighborhoods in the community, places where there had been violence 
hours before we got there, and there may have been violence after we left. But during the time while we were on those corners, a lot of people had respect for the fact that National Action Network saw it not robbery to be there and to spend time uh, with young people, engaging them, talking to people. But we found out, which we basically knew, that jobs is a major issue in our community. And so the work that we've been doing around our jobs and justice movement, we've been working with labor unions and also working with the average everyday citizen to protect jobs. That is work that is very passionate to National Action Network because we understand that without good jobs, nothing matters. The fabric of our community will be destroyed if people are not able to take care of their families. But we also understand that education is a key issue that we must address and we must look at ways to ensure that our young people are able to compete in the global space. Right now, you have young people that want to be doctors, they want to be lawyers, they want to be all of those things, but they are not getting a sound, basic, quality education. And so our organization has found ways to ensure that education is truly the 21st century issue of our time. We know that without quality education, we can hang it up in terms of having our young people become the next Ingrid Saunders Jones, the next Deborah Lee, and the next Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, the next Reverend Al Sharpton. It will not happen if we do not provide them with a quality education. And so we have been fighting for that. Helping people and communities in need is what NAN does. We actually love doing this, the work that we do. And there must be, as people say, something wrong with us because we fight against some of the hardest challenges, but we never, ever give up. Voter suppression is a major issue for us. We've been on tour with no money at all, but going around this country making sure that not only do we fight the laws, but that we get people the necessary ID so that they can vote in this election and in every local election, in every election in their community. We have been going, making sure that people are registered and that we break down this wall about voter apathy because we understand that sitting at home is not an option. Silence is not an option for our community. Our voice is our vote and our vote is our voice. So while we try to take the lead on these issues and try to be effective in the work that we do, I ask you to continue to support us. And when you go forth from this place, speak well about the National Action Network. Tell people that you know the work that we're doing is important, it is critical, and tell them that you support us and encourage them to support us in the same way. I thank you all very much and God bless you. Thank you so much, Tamika, for helping us to understand further the role of the National Action Network in fighting against tyranny and oppression of anyone due to race, gender, or sexual preference. Please keep up the great work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for our next award presentation, let's look at a brief video to learn more about Ingrid Saunders-Jones. Ingrid Saunders Jones will tell you that the most important influences in her life have always been her mother and father, Homer and Georgia Saunders. And it was family who taught her to be as involved in her community as they were. To approach life with unwavering integrity, to value education, and to have the courage of her convictions. Born in Detroit and a teacher by training, Ingrid has never been afraid of taking risks. Her early career took her from the classroom to the nonprofit world, but a decision to accept a fellowship at Atlanta City Hall changed the trajectory of her career. There she worked for Atlanta City Council President Carl Ware and the dynamic mayor of Atlanta, Maynard H. Jackson Jr. She learned about politics, stakeholder relations, leadership, policy making, and community engagement. She has that intellectual curiosity that leads 
uh, to coming up with very creative solutions to very complex human relations problems. I really, really came to appreciate her uh, extraordinary confidence and her extraordinary breath and the fact that she had such a keen grasp of community and of people and of how things should function for the betterment of the communities that we work and live in. In 1982, Ingrid joined the Coca-Cola Company, where she quickly distinguished herself through hard work and high standards. Six years later, she was promoted to Vice President of Corporate External Affairs. In 1992, she became Chair of the Coca-Cola Foundation, a role that married her business savvy and desire to empower others. Under her leadership, the Foundation has contributed nearly half a billion dollars to education and community initiatives around the world. From pressing local concerns to international challenges, Ingrid makes sure Coca-Cola's impact is positive, empowering, and enduring. The geographic reach of our giving is much wider, it's much broader today as a result of Ingrid's leadership and efforts. Ingrid's support and involvement in the RAIN initiative is also an example of where the Coca-Cola company, our partner partners, NGOs, government agencies, other multinationals are working together for a cause that is uh, common to everyone, and that's water. Want to be a part of the communities where we live and work, and Ingrid is the personification of that for the Coca-Cola system worldwide. In 1993, under Ingrid's leadership, the company launched the first generation scholarship program which has opened the doors of higher education to more than 1,300 students on more than 450 college campuses nationwide. Coca-Cola also funds the Center for Packaging Innovation and Sustainability at Michigan State University, bringing green ideas to the packages consumers use every day. She's an individual whose personal presence, passion, enthusiasm, and value is just infectious. And the work that we're doing on sustainability, which is core to our mission, is also core to her passion and the mission that she sees for Coca-Cola and the Coca-Cola Foundation. Ingrid believes she is blessed to work for the Coca-Cola Company, which allows her to use all of her skills and leadership abilities to be a trusted leader and a trusted advisor on civic and community matters. Andrew Young approached me about uh, purchasing the Martin Luther King uh, collection of papers. The first person I called uh, to determine whether the city of Atlanta and its corporate citizens and donors should buy the King collection was Ingrid Saunders Jones. And 11 days later, with her help, the city of Atlanta was able to buy that collection. So as the stories are told about the Martin Luther King collection of papers, it is told as if it is my story. It is as much Ingrid's story and a contribution she's given um, to America, really, and to the world that that collection now is at Morehouse College. She has been honored for her many contributions to corporate, civic, and community causes, including an honorary Doctor of Humanities from her alma mater, Michigan State University. This evening, the National Action Network honors Ingrid Saunders Jones with the Triumph Award for Corporate Community Achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the podium Marva Smalls. Joining Marva is this year's National Action Network's Triumph Corporate Award honoree. Ingrid Saunders-Jones. So they gave me a script to read about um, Ingrid that it's only fitting that it flew away on the stage because so much of what's in this script was on the video. Um, but let me say, I'm especially honored to be here to present this award to Ingrid, not just as co-chair of the National Action Network, but as a sister in the corporate world and peer. You know, what they didn't say in the script is 
you know, for those of you who understand sports, when it's fourth and two, Ingrid is the person you want to give the ball to, to take it over the line. And you don't have to worry about a fumble or anything. Ingrid is the sister that when Executive Leadership Council women get together and say, we want to invest in the next generation of leadership, we need to host a retreat. But we're a little short on money, a little short on vision, and a little short on inspirational leadership. Will you step in? Will you step up? And she has always, without question, without wavering, said yes. As you've seen in this video, Ingrid is the person that when the disparate politics and parties of Atlanta needs that voice of reason to help them bridge the divide and go home and be at peace with themselves while agreeing to disagree, Ingrid is that calming voice who steps in, who's respected, and who always saves the day, in my opinion. So, Ingrid, I can say personally and collectively for many women here, and my colleague Deborah Lee, who's in the audience, and I see other ELC women, you know, we have been inspired by your leadership. We've been nurtured by your friendship. And we continue to be humbled by those very strong shoulders that you don't mind stooping, leaning, allowing us to stand on, to stretch, and to achieve the greatness you have, but also to pay the way forward you have for so many of us and inspire us to do it for others. So I am pleased on behalf of Reverend Sharpton and the entire National Action Network family to present you with the corporate award for this year's Triumph Leadership. Well, the first thing I have to do, of course, is to thank Marva Smalls for that wonderful introduction. It has made me weepy. <clears throat> um, she is a very special person, um, and uh, we thank her so much for the leadership that she brings to the Executive Leadership Council, to her job, to her community, and to her industry. Now, uh, this Triumph Award, I will tell you, Sean Combs and George Lucas, I feel like the country cousin tonight. <laughs> but congratulations to both of you, too. Reverend Al Sharpton and the National Action Network, we thank them for all they do, for the way they speak up, speak out, and tell it like it is. And, and that is indeed a perfect segue into again thanking George Lucas and Sean Combs because they too speak up, speak out, and tell it like, is, like it is. They have been cultural change agents in their respective fields and I'm honored to be honored with them tonight. I'm going to do my part to keep us on time. And I'm just going to also then, before I leave, thank the Coca-Cola Company. I want to thank the Coca-Cola Company as a company. I want to thank the people of the Coca-Cola Company. And I want to thank particularly Mutar Kent at the Coca-Cola Company for trusting me to lead their community work. And I, I'm just going to be real tonight. They do trust me. They don't ask me a lot of questions. Not because I'm old, but because I'm good. But you know, being good often is not enough. 
And uh, I especially thank Mutar Kent, who has just uh, been most empowering as a chief executive officer. And so in keeping with our time constraints, I'm going to close now with a, a quote that those who know me have heard me say many times. It's a quote from John Henry Clark, who was a scholar extraordinaire from the, from the state of Georgia. And he said that history is a clock that people use to tell their time of day. It tells us who we are and what we are. It helps us find ourselves on the map of human geography. All of us write history. It's what we do today as individuals, as institutions, as corporations, as organizations that write the history of tomorrow. We have an obligation to write it well, to write it with courage, and to write it honestly. And that is what I will continue to do. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Ingrid. Ladies and gentlemen, before our final award presentation, let's again turn our attention once more to the screen to learn more about Mr. George Lucas, founder, chairman, and chief executive of Lucasfilm. I've always tried to be aware of what I say in my films, because all of us make motion picture with teachers. Teachers with very loud voices. For four decades, George Lucas has been celebrated as a visionary for his contributions to the entertainment industry. But at his heart, he remains a storyteller with a philosophy. I really wanted to take the teachings of one generation and move it to the next generation using the medium of storytelling. I wanted to stimulate the imagination of the audience, especially the younger people, to think about different worlds and different ideas and dream of things that they might not have dreamed about before. Creating some of the most diverse and beloved characters ever hit the big screen. George Lucas's films inspire us through their timeless things. Friendship, loyalty, good and bad, what we believe in. The challenge of breaking away to find your passion. These motifs are reflected in all of my movies. THX was about leaving the safety of the familiar and taking the risk of doing things that are frightening. American Graffiti was about that greatest moment in somebody's life where you go from being a high school student to going into the real world. Star Wars says we can go anywhere, do anything, but we still carry our core values with us. Indiana Jones was an adventure about taking the risk to go places that you're not familiar with to find these cultural ideas we want to pass on to the next generation. Upholding these same values, George Lucas' latest film brings the stories of a group of real-life American action heroes to the big screen in the World War II action film, Red Team. The story of the Tuskegee Airmen is a big story, and it's an amazing story. Just like Star Wars, it's a big action picture, lots of dog cars, lots of excitement, but it's basically about a whole bunch of kids that went through an amazing journey and all came out heroes. Because of George Lucas's efforts, Red Tails has now educated millions more people about the incredible achievements of the Tuskegee Airmen, while providing today's youth with much needed positive role models. They're the knights of the contemporary age, and I'm hoping that this film is an inspiration to young people today. Extending this focus further into education, Lucas established the George Lucas Educational Foundation in 1991. I strongly believe that education is the single most important job that the human race has. With a viewership of over 5 million visitors in the past year alone, its headed at home at edutopia.org perpetuates its philosophy even further with its emphasis on what works in education. 
In addition, Lucas's contributions and advocacy at film schools around the country work to benefit the next generation of filmmakers and storytellers. The National Action Network recognizes George Lucas for his deep commitment to education, for bringing a positive message and diverse range of role models to the movies, and for his inspiring impact on society. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium distinguished film and television actor and film producer, also known in the Star Wars world as Mace Windu, Samuel L. Jackson. Joining Mr. Jackson is this year's National Action Network's Triumph Arts Award honoree, Mr. George Lucas. I was actually just going to get up here and say, you know, I'm going to bring down a boy that needs no introduction since you saw all of that, but now they got stuff for me to read. But I'm going to read it fast so we can get out of here. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What an honor it is for me to present the final award tonight to someone who I consider a friend. George Lucas's devotion to timeless storytelling and cutting-edge innovation has resulted in some of the most successful and beloved films of all times. The creator of Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Lucas has given birth to characters who have entertained and inspired generations of film goers and become bedrocks of worldwide popular culture. His independent production company, Lucasfilm Limited, has garnered over 100 Academy Award nominations and more than 40 Oscars and Special Achievement Awards. He revolutionized the film industry by forming industrial light and magic to create the visual effects for Star Wars and was the first filmmaker to use computer technology. His research and development led to the first digital editing system, which later became Avid, and the Pixar computer, which led to Pixar Animation Studios. Today, Lucas is, is executive producer of the popular animated television series Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and served as executive producer on Red Tails, a film inspired by the heroic and historic exploits of America's first all-black aerial combat unit. We thank you for being so instrumental in contributing to the art and majesty that is filmmaking. Tonight, more importantly, we thank you for utilizing your talent and resources to establish your educational foundation. Your production of the film Red Tails has helped millions understand the contribution African Americans made to an era of American history. Most recently, his proposal to donate land for housing for low-income families and senior citizens is to be commended. And so, it is with pleasure I present the National Action Network's award to you, George Lucas, whom I have gotten to know and continue to admire. George, come on over with your brief remarks. <laughs> and here is yours. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I'd like to thank Reverend Sharpton and the National Action Network uh, for all they do um, and uh, also for recognizing people that are uh, struggling in the field to make this a better world. Um, for me, uh, I've always felt a need to help um, young people uh, expand their creative vision to their imagination so they can think outside the box, so they can think that the world they live in isn't the only world that could exist, that uh, you can uh, move forward and when you bump into barriers, there's a way around them. Um, and um, I dedicated my life to that. So when the story of the Tuskegee Airmen came along, it was just obvious to me that it was such a fantastic story um, that nobody seemed to know about that uh, I had to make it and I toiled away from the point where I bought the rights and worked steadily with different writers and all kinds of uh, uh, barriers uh, to uh, for 20 years to get it finally on the screen and then when I did get it onto the screen uh, we had to struggle more just to get 
uh, into the theaters because the studios didn't want to didn't want to release it. Um, and uh, it was then that it occurred to me that in full form, um, um, I was aware of it before, but not to the degree I'm aware of it now. Uh, the fact that uh, civil rights still have a long way to go in this country. Uh, anybody that says differently doesn't really know the picture. Um, I'm from the 60s. I grew up in San Francisco, lived there all my life, grew up during the Martin Luther King era, and uh, with um, you know the Civil Rights Act and all the things that we went through and all that stuff, you sort of thought that maybe we'd passed that, and we were in a post-racial world. But um, I think now we know the truth, and I think we're learning it even with President Obama, that um, we still have a long way to go before people uh, take their colored glasses off and look at everybody the same. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to do whatever we can do to help people uh, realize that um, everybody has something to contribute. Uh, that's why the Tuskegee Airmen were so uh, amazing uh, one to work with because they are amazing guys, but also an amazing story of uh, people who uh, had to overcome a lot of obstacles and one of the biggest, interesting enough, one of the biggest obstacles we had when we made the film was I kept telling everybody, and it was the same thing during the script phase, but telling everybody that this is not a film about victims. This is a film about heroes. And One of the things I noticed in stereotypes is there's, especially when I went to release it, is this, the fact that they are, they had to confront racism and those things, but the movie isn't about that, it's about them as heroes, um, through a lot of people. Because they really wanted to see them oppressed and then overcome the oppression and everything. And I said, no, these guys are just heroes. They just happen to be black. But they're heroes. Just like anybody else, any other heroes. And um, it took a long time for the everybody on the crew and the actors and everybody sort of get it because, you know, they're young and kids and they just wanted to pound away on the, the, the victim part. And I just said, you know, you're not going to go anywhere that way. You're going to only go where when you throw that away and move forward and take over the future because everything that's happened in the past is gone. And you have to make the world the way it has to be and not... Uh, feel bad about all the, the uh, struggles that uh, your race had to come up with uh, and get through to get you to where you are today. The whole human race had struggles and had to go through barriers. And, you know, we're all one race. There is no difference. We all think the same. We all feel the same. And until we can sort of realize that it's one world, one race, uh, we're always going to have troubles and wars and oppression. And uh, some people are thinking that they, by virtue of luck, fate, a little bit of talent, can rule over the rest. It's uh, going to be a, an unpleasant world. But I'm sure everybody here and a lot of other people I've run into believe otherwise and believe that we can make a great world where everybody's equal, everybody's uh, treated the same, and where we don't have a group of people who are far better off uh, than everybody else. Thank you. Congratulations, George. And can we have another round of applause for all of our honorees this evening? What an outstanding group we have saluted tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, it was my pleasure being with you this evening to celebrate the work of the National Action Network 
and pay tribute to tonight's honorees. Uh, my husband and I live in Harlem. You know, we're on Sugar Hill, and we find it great comfort to know that the National Action Network and Reverend Al are just down the street. It's really quite wonderful. Uh, for those of you who might have missed it earlier, the Gospel for Teens performed, and they're going to perform for you again one more time. Uh, but before that, I would like to introduce the chairman of the National Action Network Board of Directors, the Reverend W. Franklin Richardson. Good evening. We are delighted by your presence here tonight. We are blessed by all of the wonderful human beings that we have celebrated what God has deposited in each of them tonight. And in their deposit, all of us have been lifted. And let us, let us celebrate again our honorees tonight as they have been such a wonderful... I'm going to ask Judge Mathis to join me up here. Judge Mathis. Yeah, there he is. Judge. One of, the, one of the great supporters of National Action Network, who's always there and always articulate about our issues, is Judge, Math Judge Mathis. I want to also at this time to acknowledge the hard work of all of the staff of the National Action Network. Will you please stand? All the staff, they're different places. And I want to invite I want to invite the senior staff to come, Shanae Ingram and uh, our Vice President Michael Harding and Dominique Sharpton, membership director. Come now. I want the chapter leaders to stay and all the chapters. We have, we have over 55 chapters all over America in the National Action. Will you stand those chapter leaders who are in town who are standing here? <laughs> Reverend Sharpton already acknowledged our board of directors. I want to acknowledge them again and I want to say how important it is. We had a board meeting this morning and we are making new plans and innovative. We're staying on the case to make sure we push the National Action Network to the next level that we've we've all seen our wonderful uh, executive director. It's very important that we have in the leadership of the National Action Network not only a strong brother or strong brothers, but a strong young woman who's also taking it to the next level. Thank you, Tamika. I need you to know tonight that the National Action Network is committed. It is. Reverend Sharpton, one of the things that he's been committed about in these days is expanding the National Action Network's uh, footprint to not just be uh, a one-man show. The National Action Network is about building an institution that is going to be perpetually having change and impact on America. And so we celebrate the fact that you've come. I want to celebrate some past honorees here. I see Deborah Lee, who's here tonight. She's a past honoree of the Triumph Award. Uh, and, and others who are in this building, I may not have their names or, or seen them all, but I want to thank them all for being here tonight. I know we're all moving because we've got another agenda at 9 o'clock, and uh, I want to certainly uh, make sure that we make that agenda. Let me call on Judge Mathis now to join me in making an appeal on behalf of the organization. You know that one of the critical things of the National Action Network is how we are funded. We are funded through the support of corporations and individuals. But it's important that we keep balance in our funding because we don't want to ever be so, independent, so dependent that we lose our independence. We've got to be able to speak truth to power no matter if it's the people who are giving us money. And the only way you can do that is if you are getting independent money that is not taxed to the arenas where you operate in calling people into accountability. And so I hope tonight that those of us who are here will make a contribution. There's a card in the program, and that card is there for you to make a pledge. You can give a check tonight, or you can give an int introduction. I want to uh, call on Judge to make a word. Thank you. To your honorees, we want to thank you for all your work that you've done in our community and throughout the world. We want to thank all of you who have contributed thus far. You know, 
I'm here working with National Action Network because of my commitment throughout my, all of my adult life. I've had the opportunity of working with Reverend Sharpton for nearly three decades. When he came to Detroit and Chicago as an activist, we helped him. When we came to New York, we I'm sorry, he helped us. When we came to New York, we helped him. And so once again, I'm here trying to make a difference. And so I ask that you all will contribute. Many of us uh, contribute to agencies that do the good work of social service. But social service is one thing and social justice is another. And the more social justice we have, the less social service we need. And so we ask that you contribute tonight to the cause of social justice. You know, Reverend Al asked me if I would help solicit because the last time we had a fundraiser in my home in LA, we raised about $80,000 with me asking people to throw up their hand. So if you'll give $20,000, those of you who have it, please raise your hand and we'll find you and we'll lock the doors and make sure you don't get out. $20,000 if you would, please raise your hand, let us see you. $10,000, those who are willing to give such, I have my bailiff here somewhere, he's going to come and uh, have a fit if we don't get all the contributions we need. If you'll give $5,000, we'd like for you to put your hand up. Don't have these ladies wandering around with nowhere to go. Those who will give $1,000, throw your hands up. We'll take $1,000, we'll take $500, we'll take $100. But please, by all means, give and give until you can't anymore. Give if you want to get out of the door. Thank you all. God bless you for all your support. Give a hand. Let me say, this program has won, run smoothly and wonderfully because it has had the marvelous and brilliant talent an extraordinary ushering of Marva Smalls. Come back, Marva. We want to celebrate you. Bless you. Oh, there you are. Come on, let's show us some love. Thank you. Thank you. And so, we hope that next year you will join us. We're committed to expanding this Triumph Awards to an even larger venue. We're expanding it in terms of its reach. We're going to move to the point of telecasting it it has the potential of being another great. Let me say this finally. Our convention is in April the 3rd through the 7th in New York this year at the Sheridan Hotel. We have our Martin Luther King date, which will be announced in, it'll be in Washington, but it'll be around the inauguration activities, and we'll be back at the Triumph Awards again next year. Uh, Keepers of the Dream is in April. That's one of our big events. And look for us on the streets of America. We may be in your neighborhood. If we need us to be there, we'll show up. God bless you. Thank you very much. God, man. Good evening. My name is Noel Higginson. And before you stands the cast of Mama, I Want to Sing, featuring Vi Higginson's Gospel for Teens, and I just must take a few seconds to acknowledge that not only Nan is our neighbor in Harlem, but they're our second family. And we love you, Dominique Sharpton, Tamika Mallory. Thank you to the Reverend Al Sharpton for all the wonderful work you've been doing. I must acknowledge my mother, Vi Higginson, for she laid the groundwork for black theater for the past 30 years. And I must tell you guys, we are embarking on our 30th anniversary of Mama Wanna Sing, y'all. 30 years in the making. So please, come check us out in Harlem. Brother, y'all ready to go to church?
Travel safely and may God bless. Good night. <laughs>